finish up chapter 11. If you have your Bible, begin with me in verse 20. Everybody here want to hear the voice of God through the Word of God? Amen. Hearts that are hungry, hearts that I want to receive tonight. Amen. Let's have hearts that are in the disposition of obedience. As I said many times before that I heard from uh, one brother. If you, if you want to hear God's voice, one put it, brother put it this way, if you have the intention to obey what He'll speak to you before He'll speak, you'll never lack in hearing God's voice. If you have the intention to obey what God will speak before He speaks, you'll never lack in hearing God's voice. So let's have the, in, the intention to obey. Let's have hearts of obedience. Verse 20, I'm going to read down just to verse 24 to begin with. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who were exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. So I want to draw some observations from those first verses that we've looked at. Number one, this is one that I want to emphasize right now that the Lord has convicted me of in my life. Verse 20, we see that miracles to unbelievers are meant to bring them to repentance. And we read here that there is joy in repentance, but there is also a warning of judgment if there is a rejection of those miracles. I want, to, I want to emphasize this, my brothers and sisters, because there is a big movement in the church happening concerning miracles. And I love to see miracles. I love to see signs and wonders. I love to see healings. But I am convinced by my walk with the Lord over these years that there has been an error in this way, that it has, it has been something like, if God does a miracle, God loves you, and that's it. That is not biblical. I want us to return to the standard of the Word of God. Can I get an amen? amen. The Word of God is our plumb line. Listen to biblically what happens when a miracle takes place. Because the Lord is more concerned about our souls and our bodies. If that wasn't the case, He wouldn't have said, if your hand offends you, then cut it off. Better that you lose one member than your whole soul to be cast into hell. Or what Jesus said it is, what does a prophet a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul, right? So listen, listen to how a miracle was handed, handled in Acts chapter 3. The lame man is healed by the power of God. Listen to Peter. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through God's servant. The same Holy Spirit that's in our midst right now. And he says, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man to walk. You see that? Right away, he's getting his, their eyes off of men. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go but you denied the holy one and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the prince of life whom God raised up from the dead of which we are witnesses and in his name through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know yes the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that, that the Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent! This is the message. This is the culmination. This is what the emphasis is on. Repent! 
therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, I believe, I want to see miracles, but I, I, I believe the Lord spoke to me some time ago. And I believe He said to me, Son, if I move, are you prepared to speak what I want you to speak when it happens? And I believe the Lord spoke to me that this is why there are not a, not a lot of miracles happening in the church, because the church isn't ready what to say if a miracle happens. And I want to challenge you tonight that you would ask the Lord and say, God, I want to be a vessel, and am I ready to emphasize what you emphasized when a miracle took place? That I can be entrusted with this anointing, with this power, lest any number of things happen, right? Number one... The first thing that Peter says, don't look at me. Don't think that I have this power my own, and don't think it's because of my righteousness that you're seeing this miracle take place. This is because of Jesus. But the, the preparation, I believe, is very important for you and I before we start praying for the sick, the unbelievers, that, that we are ready to immediately Point them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sign and the miracle is to point them to Jesus because that is the, that is the only thing that will save them from their sins. So my question I want to submit to you before we move on, will you and I be responsible to preach repentance? It's not a very pleasant message in 2020. And you and I have to count the costs. As the old Keith Green song was based upon, I forgot who he, what, what was the famous Puritan or man of God of the past that said, if you want to, you're going to preach the, the the prophet who's going to preach repentance, better pledge his head to heaven. You better you better pledge your head because that it's, as Leonard Ravenhill said, there's only one there's only one answer for the man or the woman that starts preaching repentance all put their head. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear I got to change my life. I don't, I don't want to hear that I got to go another way. But I'm going to tell you, when you see a genuine miracle, there is a moment you will see, mo I've seen many times, over their eyes, over their face, there is a reckoning. I have just encountered the living God. And in that moment, you'll look at them and you'll see there's a sobriety that they're recognizing, what am I going to do in response to what just happened to me? And if you and I mess that up, Woe well unto us. Woe well unto us. Because what it's doing is it's creating greater judgment if we're not ready to give the message of repentance. It's as I testified a couple weeks ago, it was wonderful when I was out in Seneca, South Carolina to see that woman as the power of God went into her body and she was racked in pain. She couldn't straighten out her leg. And the power of God came upon her. She says, I feel like electricity is going through my body. She stands up completely healed. All pain leaving her body, weeping, saying, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. And, the, and what, what was the fruit of that? Her husband came to repentance. Her husband was convicted that God visited my house. And I need to change the way I'm living. That's how it should be. Amen? Amen. Not just, that's wonderful, have a nice day. Number two, the second thing I want us to see in these verses is that Jesus, we see His deity here. We said this before, Matthew is revealing this clearly to the Jews, who's His primary audience, to show the deity of Jesus Christ. From the very beginning of chapter 1, His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. So what is the aspect of deity that being shown here? God's omniscience. Jesus didn't even already know everything in his midst. He is so omniscient, he, would have, he, he knows things that didn't happen that would have happened if there was another factor or variable in that equation. That's how omniscient Jesus is. He's saying with all conviction, not hypothetically, if these acts had been done in Sodom or tired Sodom, they would have repented. I know that as the eternal Son of God. So we see that there's a revelation of the deity of Jesus Christ here. We see that He is showing His omniscience. 
He's showing that he knows all possible situations, even the ones that did not happen. Number three, this is a, this is a one I think that people wonder about. They say, well, if, 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 God, if someone dies without Jesus, is everyone going to receive the same judgment? And the answer is no. And it's right here. This is one of the, there's one of many passages, but here's one right here. What does it say? It says it will be more tolerable. There's other places Jesus says this. In other words, there is not going to be the same judgment. Yes, without Christ there is hell. But even in that place of damnation, there is levels. There is, there is degrees. It is not all the same punishment because God is just. In the same way, there are different levels of reward in heaven. Not everyone is just going to go to heaven and have the same inheritance. There will be some people that have, will have more reward than other people on the earth. Is that not true? Yes or, yes or no? Amen. And the same way we see here that not everyone will receive the same punishment. There will be those that will be punished more strictly based upon not only their sin and the walking and, and obstinance of heart and rebelliousness, but they will be judged according to the revelation that was given to them. If they reject the revelation given to them, they're going to be judged more harshly. This is very clear in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus said, they will be beat with many stripes or few stripes based upon the knowledge of the will of the Master. They're going to be judged more harshly. So this, this should settle this. This is not one universal... No, there's going to be a, a worse states of judgment for people. And I don't want to get into extra biblical uh, experiences, but I know as I went to Papua New Guinea... And I was able to talk to those people that had seen heaven and seen hell. That, I, that Some of you guys have heard my testimony about that. And there's many other testimonies that they said they saw different degrees of people being punished according to the sins that they desired to hold on to in this lifetime. Whatever idol that they wanted more than Jesus. Number four. To finish out here. What is the Lord looking for? What is Jesus looking for? We've already said it one time. He's looking for repentance. Turning from what we know is wrong and turning to what is right. And what I want to say in, in connection to that is, what is the key for repentance? What is the key? And it's here what Jesus says. You can see he's, he's, he's alluding to it. He says to Capernaum what? You are, you are exalted. The key to repentance is humility. And what keeps people from repentance is pride. And there's an illusion here that Jesus is, is, is giving a biblical reference to Isaiah 14. It's very interesting. That he says, you are exalted up to the heavens, but you will be brought down to Hades. Does anybody know where that is in the Old Testament? That's Isaiah 14. And it isn't interesting, even though in the context it's to the king of Babylon, that is the context of the fall of Satan. That is the call to Lucifer, the morning star. What does it say in Isaiah 14? How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And then what does it say? You shall be brought down to Sheol, or Hades, to the lowest depths of the pits. That's the reference Jesus is making here. There is the connection and that's why Jesus was so forward and so straightforward with the Pharisees. He was calling the Pharisees to repentance. And he was so straightforward to the point that he said what? You are of your father, the devil. And part of the being, the, the, the clear separation between who Jesus is, and we're going to see this in a moment as we finish this chapter, the main character of Jesus and the main characteristic or attribute of the devil. They are exactly the opposite. And the devil's, of course, is pride. 
And so what is the Lord looking for? And what are these warnings to? They are against the arrogant and the proud at heart who refuse to, to humble themselves and to repent. This is a strong warning, friend, and this is the reality of eternity. And that's why we gather here. That's why we gather together. That's why we read the Word. That's why, we, that's why the assembly is important. It's not an extremity. It's not something that is like a, uh, I ought to just do it because it's the right thing to do. I grew up doing it. When we assemble together, there's a grace released that God reminds us of what's important in life. He reminds us that we're a vapor. He reminds us that we're going to spend eternity very soon in the presence of God. And we are brought to a sobriety. What am I living for? Does my life, does it make sense in light of eternity? And it brings us to a place of evaluation, of self-examination. Am I doing what God has called me to do? Am I satisfying His will for my life? Am I ready to give an account? That's why we need to hear the word of the Lord. We don't need to hear just good stories, amen? We don't need to hear a, a good motivational message. We need the Word of God. The Word of God is our meat. The Word of God is our substance. The Word of God brings faith. The Word of God brings clarity of vision. We need the Word of God. So let's finish this part, this chapter together. Verse 25. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father... Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So some observations I want to make to this. Number one, do you hear the, rep the repetition of this attribute that the Lord loves and the Lord delights in, and it is humility. The wise and prudent are wise and prudent in their own eyes. And the babes are the one who recognize that they need God. Psalm 25 came to mind. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore He teaches sinners in the way, and the humble He guides in justice, and the humble He teaches His way. Amen? That's what the Lord is looking for. He's looking for humility. And if we don't get this, friend, we're going to miss every other grace in, the, in our lives. If this doesn't come resounding in our spirits every time we pray, then something's the matter. Why did God choose Moses? Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Because of his humility. Why did God choose David? Because of his humility. Why did God choose, Jesus choose these apostles? Because of their humility. The Lord is looking for humble people. And those are the ones that get his revelation. If you want to draw closer to God, if you want more of the Lord, friend, you've got to humble yourself. I mean, really, there's only two options. You can wait for the Lord to humble you, or you can humble yourself. And that's what the Bible reveals over and over again, right? Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, that He will lift you up. That's our responsibility. Every time you fast, every time you pray, every time you go to the Word and say, God, I need you, speak to me as I read this Word, you're humbling yourself. Every time we don't pray, every time that we go and make our own decisions, every time we're presumptuous, we are showing that there is a lack of humility. Every time we are offended, we are showing a lack of humility. Every time we think that we have a right to hold on to unforgiveness, 
we are showing a lack of humility. The second thing I want you to see here is what does Jesus say? No one knows the Father except the Son. Jesus is constantly showing the exclusivity of His relationship and His way of salvation. There is not many ways to God. There is only one way to God. There is only one way, friend, and this is going to be a message that's going to be more and more unpopular in our day, in our society. And you better be ready to die for it. You better be convicted of it. Because when push comes to shove, you better be ready. No, Jesus is the only way. And be unapologetic. And I would even encourage you to use even like illustrations or stories like this. Let's say your child is down by the ocean and your child is drowning and you're too far, you can't do anything about it. They're dying in front of you. And out of nowhere, somebody comes and runs in and, and is able to be able in, the, in that tide to, to grab something, to put your child on and to push him back to shore. And sure enough, that person ends up dying, saving your child. Are you going to say, well, anybody could have saved my child. Anybody could have done it. No, not anybody. It had to be someone with the ability and the one who was there to do it. Not just anybody. Or you, right? You're on the, you're on the road and you got your sound system on. You don't even listen. There's a, there's a truck coming down the road and you, there's, people are screaming. This person's screaming at you. And you're, you're oblivious. You're about to be struck. And they run out at the last moment. They push you off the road and they themselves are struck by the, the truck. Are you going to say, well, man, I'm so thankful to be alive, but, but anybody could have saved me. Do you see how offensive that is? Do you see how ridiculous a statement that is, like that is? Do you see how, how crazy that is to say, you have completely denied the sacrifice that was made for you? And is that not what people are doing today concerning Jesus Christ? Well, it's, it's, it's okay for you, but there's Buddha, and there's Muhammad, and there's Krishna. No, friend. Buddha didn't die for you. Krishna didn't hang on a cross, bleeding from head to foot for you. None of them said, I am the Savior. None of them rose from the dead. Only Jesus. No one knows the Father except the Son. So we thank you, Jesus, that we acknowledge tonight. There's no one like you, Jesus. You're the only one that fulfilled all those prophecies. Hallelujah. Number three. Jesus says, come to me. He didn't say, come to the temple. He didn't say, go over there. He said, come to me. And that's the same call he's making to you and I and to everyone, friend. Who are we going to run to when the burdens are realized? Are we going to run to some other thing that's going to comfort us? Or are we going to come to Jesus? Are we going to run to a person? Are we going to run to... The internet. Are we going to run to some kind of other idol that will try to bring us comfort? Or are we going to come to Jesus? Jesus has come to me. And who does he say come to me to? He said come to me those who are burdened. Not, they, first they recognize their own burden. That's who comes to Jesus. They, they recognize I got a heavy burden. I, got, I, have, I have something heavy. I have a yoke in my life. That could be the burden of addiction. It could be the yoke of depression. It could be the burden of a broken heart. Jesus has come to me. It could be the yoke of self-hatred. Jesus has come to me. It could be the burden of finances or the yoke of a bad doctor report. The burden of a broken relationship or the yoke of a regret of the past. Jesus has come to me. But ultimately, the yoke that we know Jesus came to break 
was the yoke spoken of by Paul in Romans 8, the yoke of bondage, the yoke of sin, the yoke and the burden of iniquity. And to those who cry out, they're able to be delivered from that. Amen. Number four, look how Jesus describes himself. You've heard me say this before. Jesus could have used so many different attributes to, to, to identify himself by. He could have said, I'm just. I'm righteous. He could have said, I'm merciful. I'm loving. But the attribute that we see where he clearly says who he is by nature, the primary way he identified himself is that he said, I am lowly of heart. I am humble. We are never more like Jesus than when we're humble. And we're never, we're never more like the enemy when we're full of pride. Isn't it interesting you see Paul... Paul understood this. You see this constant remindance, remembrance from Paul, reminder from Paul, constantly saying over and over again. And he's constantly calling to mind the, the centrality and the foundational attribute of, of lowliness of mind. And then, like in Philippians 2, why? Why should we be humble? Why should we prefer others above ourselves? Paul says, have this mind that was in Christ. Who thought it not robbery, that he would, he would lay aside all that he could have been and all he could have done to humble himself and to be a servant and to even give himself in such a way of obedience to even be a servant and, a, and, and, and obedient unto death, even death of the cross. Not any death, but the death of the most shameful, despicable, humiliating death we've ever known. The death of, of the cross. Where those who were crucified were crucified naked. Publicly exposed and shamed and ridiculed and, and all and just mocked as you were just there helpless. Suffering and gasping for breath. And Jesus chose that. And he set for us an example of ultimate humility. This is our Jesus. Amen? This is the Jesus we serve. This is the Jesus we worship. He is the Jesus of humility. And if we want to be like Jesus, if we want to walk like Jesus, if we want to show the world how beautiful Jesus is, my brothers and my sisters, it's going to come down to what kind of humility are you going to walk in? What kind of servant are you going to be to people around you? How are you going to deny yourself? How are you going to serve people? And I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing more than humbling yourself and serving that will reveal how much your flesh is crucified. As someone said, everybody wants to be called a servant of Christ and so they're treated like one. I'm going to say that again. Because you need to get it in your heart and you need to use it and give it away to somebody else. Everybody has a mind, well, they can call themselves a servant until they're treated like one. That's when it's going to be revealed whether you really have a servant heart. No need to talk about your education. No need for people to know who, you, who they're really talking to. No need to flash your credentials. No need to tell you them that you're a doctor of this and a doctor of that. No need to tell them about your, what kind of, of kind of work. That can come up in conversation if it comes up, but that's not who you are. Who you are is a slave of Christ. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. For those of you that probably, you already know this, a yoke was a wooden structure that was put between two oxen, two cows, two bulls, or horses, and you, you, it would go around their necks, and they would carry that in unity and in unison together. Scripturally, though, it is, it is most often used we talked about the, the principle of first time mention. First time the word yoke is mentioned is Genesis 27. And it's not in a good context. It's Esau. 
that's Esau being basically given the leftovers of a blessing that his brother stole. And he's told, you'll break off this yoke eventually when you get restless. It's a yoke that we see, if you look up the word in, in the in a Strong's Concordance, it's used a lot in the with the prophet Jeremiah. It's used a lot in the context of Solomon. You remember that? When his son Rehoboam, the yoke of your dad, the yoke was too much for us. That's how you, use, you see it most often used. It's most often used as a burden or oppression. And Jesus has taken that from us. Amen. He's taken the weight of our sin, the burden of our sin, and he's brought it on himself. And that's why it would be wise to take that yoke and not to hold on to it for yourself. But it's also a picture of walking in alignment. But truly, Jesus is the stronger of, of the two of us. And so he takes the weight of that. Amen? That's why he says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Whatever you're going through, I say this, I've said this before to people. I said, listen, remember that Jesus is the Lord. The Father's shoulders are stronger than yours are. His shoulders are much broader than yours. So whatever you're carrying, give it to Him. Doesn't mean that we, have to, we don't bear our own burdens, but we are to walk with the Lord and we carry and we depend upon His strength and praise the Lord. Who can be witness tonight? He's given us the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And so yes, the yoke of Jesus is much easier. So tonight I want us just to close in a, in a word of prayer. If you didn't know this and realize, we're, we're just a little bit over a week away from the day of Pentecost. And how many know that the Lord is the Lord of the calendar? The, the Jewish calendar. He's the one that thought of it. He's the one that appointed those days. So, and a week from now, it's important to the Lord. Just as much we just in the beginning talked and celebrated the anniversary of Doug and Benita and Rocky and Diane. That's the anniversary of the church. That's the birth of the church. Amen. It's, it means something to, the, to Jesus. He remembers that day. He was there that day when his spirit was poured out and they went out preaching the gospel and 3,000 were saved in that day. How many know we need to return to that standard again? Let us consecrate ourselves this week in prayer. Let us humble ourselves. Let's shut ourselves in more than we have maybe in the last week to give ourselves to prayer. Let's come and wait with expectation next Sunday that, oh God, would you be pleased to pour out your Spirit in much the same way that those apostles carried such an anointing that 3,000 were converted in a day. And, and Lord, just as we looked at today, may you see in us that we are ready to give a message of repentance like Peter did on that day of, of Pentecost. That we're not going to be conformed to a culture that just wants a good message that makes me feel better about myself. But doesn't tell me what I really need, and that is a Savior and a Lord who is worthy of all praise and has paid the ultimate price. So let's close in a word of prayer. Right now where you are, I'm going to ask my brother Ricky's going to come up. I thought it would be appropriate as uh, Ricky would sing this song um, about prayer, the Lord's Prayer. So right where you are, I just want you just to just close your eyes. We're going to just take a moment right now just, just to look to this coming week and say, Lord, I need grace and strength to, to prepare my heart, Lord, and I want to be in a place of deeper level of consecration that, Lord, come this Sunday, I will be positioned that you can do what you want to do in my life and Lord, there will be something in my spirit that's connecting me to this family that is through the centuries, pointing back to that first Pentecost of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Oh friend, can you picture it in your mind right now? Can you picture 
in your mind them gathered in the upper room? Can you picture the wind coming through? Can you picture the joy and the boldness filling their hearts that they would have been like, this is it. Come on. We're gonna, I don't care if we die. We, we have the Spirit of the living God living inside of us. I'm giving my all to Him. So right now, is, is, is we just take a moment just to make your own personal prayer a confession of humility to God, of calling on Him right now to fill you with that humility. To be entrusted with what he wants to do through you because you're prepared. Just right now, just talk to the Lord. Oh God, see in us humility. Forgive us of our pride. Cleanse us, God, of our arrogance. Wash us of our of any offense. Help us, Lord God, to walk truly humble before you. Lord, you rebuked these cities because they had lifted themselves up, because they refused to repent. And God, there is a warning to America. It's more than what's our rights. It's more than us booking against the government and being angry because of refusing the church to assemble. It's a time of humiliation. It's a time of humbling ourselves. It's a time to seek the face of the Lord. To say, oh God, find me at the foot of the cross. Find me in a place of prayer. Jesus taught us to pray. He taught us to pray. Amen. 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 
we just thank you for this time together, God, just to be in your presence. Lord, even as we sang, I just speak a blessing out over everyone here. Lord, you bless everyone here, that you keep them, that you make your face shine upon them, that you be gracious unto them, Lord, that you lift up your countenance upon them, give them your peace. Father, fill everyone here with the knowledge of your will. You said, Lord God, in your word, redeem the time. The days are evil. Don't be unwise, but know and discern what the will of God is. So we pray that discernment right now upon everyone here right now. In Jesus' name, what is God saying? What does he want me to do? I will obey. I will obey. Father, we bless your holy name tonight. Full surrender. Here we are, Lord. We lay our bodies down as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is our reasonable act of worship. Thank you for being with us. Thank you that you will never leave us or forsake us.